Our next topic is still on annuities, but it's about simple and general annuity dues. Okay, so last time we did the ordinary simple, ordinary general. This time we're going to do the simple annuity due and the general annuity due. So again, we have some online tutorials that you can go through. Um, we were responsible for both the future value and present value of the simple annuity dues and the general annuity dues. We'll also be taking a look at the calculating the periodic payment in another video lesson. This one here, that's just for your interest in case you need, need to calculate the number of payments and the time period. So again, if we recall from last time, we had looked at annuities as being a series of regular payments. So this time around, we're going to look at annuity dues where our payments are at the beginning of the period as opposed to the end of the period. And again, simple when the compounding period and payment period are the same and general when the compounding period and payment period are not the same. Now the formula for the annuity dues. So here was the ordinary annuities 102A and 102B. When we have the annuity dues, you can see that the future value and present value formulas have the little subscript due on them. And they pretty much look identical, except that there is an additional term at the end of it. Just like our ordinary annuities, though, we will be needing to take a look for the general case of calculating our equivalent interest rate. So make sure that you're familiar with plugging in the values to these formulas and then also using your calculator or Excel to calculate them. The terms are all the same as before, term T, payment PMT, number of payments N, N is equal to the M times the T, so the number of compounding periods M and T, the time in years. We're still dealing with a nominal interest rate, and again, we're going to require a periodic rate, and if it's straightforward, we can just go the periodic rate is J over M. If it's not straightforward, we have to use the equivalent interest rate formula. So just to recap, for due, payments are going to be at the beginning of each payment period and simple, just like before the simple case, where the payment period and the compounding period are the same. For the general, again, due meaning it's at the beginning of the payment period, general meaning the compounding period and the payment period are different. So maybe we're, be, we're paying something monthly, but the compounding period is say semi-annual, semi-annually or quarterly. So this is something that we're going to have to keep track of just like we did last time. We're going to have to be able to identify when we have an annuity and whether it's a due annuity or a general annuity due or a simple annuity due. So let's take a look at some examples here. We have Martha making contributions of $350 at the beginning of every six months for eight years towards an RRSP, so a register, registered retirement savings plan. If the RRSP earns an interest at 5.6% compounded semi-annually, what's the value of the RRSP at the end of the time period? So a couple things here. First off, we're looking for the value at the end of the time period. So that would be future value. We know we're making regular payments, so it's a kind of annuity. And this is where we have to pay attention. When are the payments being made? At the beginning of the period instead of the end. So say at the beginning of the month as opposed to the end of the month. In this case, it's the beginning of every six months. So the beginning of every semi-annual period and our compounding is semi-annually. So beginning means due, and these two match the payment period, semi-annual, compounding period, semi-annual. That's gonna be simple. So simple annuity due. Determine the cash value of beginning of month lease payments of $1,200 in advance to be made over the next two years at a rate of 9% compounded monthly. Now here we have a case where we see that terminology again, determine the cash value. So that means we're trying to figure out the present value. We have two terms here, beginning of month and in advance. Both of those indicate that our payments are at the start of the period. So at the beginning of this month and in advance would be you pay it at the beginning of the month. 
So again, <clears throat> we're making regular payments. And the beginning means we have an annuity due. And because we're making monthly payments and compounding monthly, again, that's going to be simple. So simple annuity due. Our next example, we have Mr. Sutton contributing $525 at the beginning of each year into a registered, registered retirement savings plan, RRSP, paying 6% compounded quarterly. We want to know how much will he have in the RRSP after 11 years. And after 11 years, how much of that amount is interest that he's actually earned. So again, we have regular payments, so it's an annuity. The payments at the beginning, so it's an annuity due. And this time we have yearly payments being made and quarterly compounding. Those two periods don't match, so it's a general annuity due. Then lastly, we have a property in Waterford. It was purchased with a down payment of $35.25 and then regular payments of $20.25 at the beginning of every six months for nine years. And our interest was compounded monthly at 6%. We want to know what the purchase price of the property is and what was the cost of financing. And remember, we had seen this term cost of financing in our ordinary annuities. And that's just another way of asking how much interest did we have to pay. So again, with regular payments, so our regular payments of 2025 are at the beginning of every six months. So at the beginning of the semi-annual period. So beginning means due. And we have compounding monthly and semi-annual payments. So those don't match. So again, we have general. So if we take a look at the future value of a simple annuity due, simple and general annuity dues, let's compare an annuity due to an ordinary annuity. So here we have the annuity due, very similar to the ordinary annuities where we're showing yearly payments in five years, but this time around the payments are at the beginning. So as opposed to an ordinary annuity, the payments would be at the end of the year. So this time around with annuity dues, the payments are at the beginning. When we're calculating the future value of an annuity due, you can see that the last payment is at the beginning of the last year. So this is the beginning of year five versus the end of year five. Each of these payments would have to go into the future. And again, they're going into the future via compound interest. So in order to do this particular calculation, we'd have to use that compound interest three, four, five times. And we can see a pattern to the calculations. We have the five years, four, three, two, one. If we compare the future value formulas for an annuity due, and for an ordinary annuity, so that's the bottom one, we can see how the exponent starts at a different spot. Okay, so just to bring that to your notice. But again, rather than do these things manually, we do have a summary formula for future value of an annuity due. It's the exact same future value payment, but we have this one extra period, one plus i. And that one extra period is akin to this last payment, instead of being at the end of five years, it's at the beginning of five years. So that payment has to move up. Here's an example. We have Martha making contributions of 350 at the beginning of every six months for eight years for her RRSP. The interest she earns is 5.6 compounded semi-annually. And we want to know what's the value of her RRSP at the end of the time period. So this is a simple annuity due like we already identified before. So here's our timeline, zero today, eight years in the future. Our payments are being made at the beginning. So the first payment is at time zero. Okay. Our payment periods are every six months, so semi-annuals. We need to take those series of payments into the future and figure out what its value is. Now again, please notice the last payment is now at the beginning of the last period versus at the end of the last period. So watch out for that. Our payments are 350 and they're 350 per semi-annuals. 
We have two semi-annual payments per year times eight years. So we have 16 half yearly or semi-annual payments. Now, because this is a simple annuity due, and remember it's simple because we have 5.6% compounded semi-annually and we have payments semi-annually. So that allows us to do the simple calculation for our periodic interest rate, the 056 nominal rate divided by the number of compounding periods two, and we get 028 per half year or per semi-annual. Plugging all that into the formula and be careful when you're doing this. It's very common to forget this last term when using the future value due formula for an annuity due. There's our payment 350. There's our periodic rate per semi-annual, periodic rate per semi-annual. There's it again, periodic rate per semi-annual and the number of semi-annual periods. So we're still seeing that the number of the payment period, the number of periods and the periodic rate have to have the same units. So if we calculate this and round everything off, at the end of her eight years, Martha is going to have $7,139.09 in her RRSP. If you have the Texas BA2 Plus calculator, there is functionality for doing this exact same question. The first thing you'd have to do is set your calculator to something called BGN which stands for beginning because the payment date is at the beginning of the payment period. So we have to tell the calculator it's an annuity due. How we do this is that we press the second key followed by the BGN key, then press the second key again followed by the set key. And then we can enter the values. Our N would be 16. Our given nominal rate is 56. We're making two payments per year. We're compounding our interest twice a year. Our present value is zero. Our payment is the minus 350. Again, remember negative because we are giving money. And the future value is what we're going to compute, the CPT button. And again, we would get the exact same answer. Let's try another example. This one, Mr. Sutton, is the one where he's contributing $525 at the beginning of each year into his RRSP, and his RRSP gets 6% compounded quarterly. Now here again, we have to know how much does he have after 11 years, and after 11 years, how much interest did he actually earn? Now this is a general annuity due, due because of the beginning, that's when the payments are being made, but they're yearly payments, but we have compound, compounding quarterly. So those don't match, so we have general. And just like our ordinary annuities, the general case requires that extra step. So if we take a look at our timeline, here's today. My first payment is today, $525 at the beginning of the year. We go to 11 years. Now we are making just yearly payments. So the last payment again is at the beginning of the 11th year. So again, remember beginning means ordinary, yearly payments and quarterly rate don't match. So that means general, okay? So just watch out for these things. We want to know what is the future value of those series of payments. So we're going to need a periodic rate per year because remember the periodic rate must match the payment period. So the periodic rate period must match the payment period. We can't just do 0.06 divided by four because that would be per quarter, not per year. Our number of payments is 11 years times one payment per year because we're making yearly payments. So just 11 yearly payments. And we can see again, just like we did before, we're checking that these two units match. So we need our extra step. And remember our extra step is to calculate the equivalent, equivalent in this case, annual rate. Annual rate because we have the yearly payments. We have our formula for before, from before, our required or our new 
periodic rate is equal to one plus the old periodic rate raised to the power of the old compounding periods to our new compounding periods. All of that subtract one. Plugging in our information, well, our originally given periodic rate, the I1, is going to be the nominal rate O6 divided by the number of compounding periods 4. And remember the M1 matches that rate, so M1 is 4. And the one we want is the annual rate, so that's why we have a 1 here. And when we calculate that out, we get decimal 061 with all the decimals per year. And don't forget, we need to keep all the decimals in our calculations. Let's continue on then and let's use our future annuity, future value due formula. So there's our payment, there's our 1 plus the yearly periodic rate to the 11 compounding periods or 11 yearly periods minus 1 over 061 times the 1 plus 061 extra term. And again, remember the dot dot dots means that we're using all the decimals in these calculations. If we do it longhand, we should be getting that Mr. Sutton's RRSP has grown to $8,402.55 at the end of 11 years. So that's our first answer. Now we wanted to know how much of this was actually interest that he earned. We had seen this in the ordinary annuities. So again, the amount of interest that was earned is equal to the fixed future value of the RRSP minus the total amount that he paid into the RRSP. And remember, that's just the number of payments that he made times his payment amount. So if we plug that in, it's the 8402.55. And we're going to subtract. He made 11 payments of 525 each. Do this subtraction. And he wound up earning $2,627.55 in interest. So very similar calculation to before. Let's take a look at the present value. Very similar to the ordinary annuity. We're going to have to bring all our payments back. In this particular case though, because this is an annuity due, remember our first payment is made in advance or at the beginning, so it's at time zero. So here we don't actually have any calculation to do the payment is the payment. And then each of these subsequent payments need to be brought back. So we can see the pattern with the exponents is that there's a payment with a accumulation factor being raised to the zero power and then negative one, negative two, negative three, and negative four respectively, however many payments are coming back. If again we compare the present value of an ordinary annuity to the present value of an annuity due, we can see differences in the exponents. Okay, But once again, we wouldn't want to do this longhand. What we do is we have a summary formula that again, the first part is exactly like the present value of an ordinary annuity, but again, we have one more accumulating factor. And again, we do have the 1 minus the 1 plus i to the negative n, meaning we're coming back to the present. So let's try a couple of examples for here. We want to know the cash value. So what's the value today or what's the present value of beginning of month lease payments of $1,200 in advance to be made over the next two years at a rate of 9% compounded monthly. Now we had identified this before as a simple annuity due, due because it's beginning of month payments, simple because we have monthly payments and compounding monthly. They both match. So here's our timeline. Here's our first payment made at the beginning of the month. So there's our 1200 there. There's our last payment made at the 24th month or the 24th last payment at the beginning of that last month. And there's our nominal rate compounded monthly, 9%. We want to bring that entire series of payments to today to be able to calculate it. Because it's a simple case, because we have monthly payments and monthly compounding, we're allowed to do a simple calculation, the nominal rate divided by the number of compounding periods. 
So our periodic rate is double knot seven five per month. We also need the number of monthly payments in this two year term. So two years times 12 payments per year, we have 24 monthly payments. And again, just double checking, double checking, excuse me, that the month periodic rate is per month and we have monthly payments, these two periods match. We can then just plug all our information into our formula. Again, don't forget that extra term at the end. Don't forget the negative exponent. Take your time in doing these calculations. It might take you a while to um, be comfortable in using your calculators for these. And now we have present value is the 26, 463.98, okay? So if she had, um, <clears throat> for this lease payment, say for example, instead of wanting to have to do the lease, say we wanted to buy it out today, what would be the cash value today that I'd have to pay? I'd have to pay 26, 93.98. Let's try another example. We have a property in Waterford. We had purchased it with a down payment of 35.25. And then we had regular payments of 20.25 at the beginning of every six months for nine years. And the interest we're being charged is 6% compounded monthly. We wanna know what was the purchase price of the property and how much was the cost of financing. And remember, cost of financing is just another way of saying how much interest was I being charged. So two things that are going on. We have the 3525 down payment. It is today, so we don't have to bring it back to today. It's already there. And the 2025 semi-annual payments are being made at the beginning, so it's an annuity due. We have semi-annual payments, but we have monthly compounding, so that means it's a general annuity due, and we have to bring that series of payments back. And remember, for a general annuity due, we have to calculate the equivalent, in this case, semi-annual periodic rate. Why semi-annual? Because our payments are semi-annual. So we can plug in our values. Here's our equivalent rate. Our semi-annual periodic rate is going to be 1 plus the periodic rate monthly, 06 over 12. All of that raised to the 12 over 2, and then subtract 1. And if we do that calculation correctly, we should get 0303 with all the decimals per semi-annual. So let's go ahead and solve the purchase price and the cost of financing. So as we said for the down payment, the 3525 is there today. It doesn't have to move at all. So it's just present value is 3525. For our annuity, we do have to take these series of payments for the general annuity too, back to today. And remember, we said that the periodic rate was 0303 with all the decimals per semi-annual, and we had 18 semi-annual payments. Plugging that into our present value of annuity due formula, there's our payment, there's our periodic rate in the three spots, and then there's our number of semi-annual payments coming back. So the present value of the annuity is 2860553. So the first question had asked us what was the purchase price. So our purchase price, we just have to add these two values up. So the 3525 plus the 2860553, our purchase price is 3213053. Now we are financing this purchase and when we finance something, somebody is giving us the money up front or <clears throat> sorry, we are making payments. Um, they're not giving us money. We are making payments in order to pay off the purchase of uh, whatever we've bought. So we have to, because we're allowed to pay over time, the person who's selling us the item says, okay, well, um, you know, instead of getting, getting all my money now, I'll let you make regular payments. But because you're making regular payments, you're also going to have to pay me interest on that. Because I need, you know, I'm not getting all my money up front. So you're going to have to ensure that my costs are covered. So the cost of financing, again, that's another way of saying how much interest is being paid. And in the present value scenario, 
our cost of financing or the amount of interest being paid is the total we paid. So the number of payments times the payment amount, just like before, but this time around subtract the present value. So in this case, the cost of financing is our 18 payments times payments of 2025, multiply that out and subtract the 2860553. So our cost of financing winds up being 7,844.47. So that's the amount of interest that we have to pay in order to be able to make regular payments. Let's take a look at leases again. Again, this is a little beyond the scope of our course, but they've been included because it's the type of thing that as potential business owners, you might get involved in this type of scenario at some point in time. So we have a lease that presents an alternative to obtaining a loan to purchase an asset, okay? With a lease, the lessee makes regular payments to essentially borrow an asset from the lessor, the bank, company, etc., throughout the term of the lease. The lessee does not own the asset during or after the term. The ownership remains with the lessor. Now that's a lot of jargon with lease, lessee, and lessor. Let's make it simple. I have a vehicle I want to buy. I decide not to purchase it outright or get a loan to purchase it. I decide to lease it from the dealership. So I'm the lessee. I'm going to make regular payments to the dealership. And what I get for those regular payments is I get the use of the vehicle, okay? That vehicle technically still belongs to the lessor. It still belongs to the dealership. It doesn't belong to me throughout the whole term of the lease. I just get the right to use it. So typically what happens is that very often in lease situations, we have to make a lump sum payment down payment at the start of the lease. Then we have to recognize that at the end of the lease, we typically have a residual or expected value of the asset at the end of the lease term. So for example, if I have a three year lease on a vehicle, at the end of three years, that vehicle still has some value. So it still has a residual value or expected value. And I either have to buy that out or I have to let it go back to the dealer. And then the lease amount, so that's gonna be the value of the asset at the beginning of the lease. It's made up of three different components. A down payment, if I make a down payment, present value of all the lease payments, and then present value of the residual value. So we saw similar to this with ordinary annuities, where we had to bring back the present value of the lease payments via an annuity, and then the present value of the residual amount or expected value, we brought this one back via compound interest. There's another term, we're not gonna go into this too much, but there's a, something called a buyback value, and that's the value of the asset on a specific date. The buyback would be the present value of the remaining payments plus the present value of the residual amount, again, on that specific date. Again, this is a, a little bit of a um, com more complicated but real life situation. Uh, again, if I go back to my vehicle that I'm leasing, maybe at the end of two years, I actually do want to buy it back. So I have to pay for the remaining payments on my lease. And I also have to pay the present value of the residual value at the time of the buyback. Okay, we're just going to take a look at the lease amount though. So here's an example where we have a car dealership has given Stephanie the following two options. Her first option is to buy the vehicle outright and pay $51,500. Her other option is to do a lease. And if she does the lease, she's going to have to make a down payment of $27,500 and then make regular lease payments of three ninety dollars at the beginning of every month for two years. At the end of the two years, she'll be given the option to purchase the vehicle for the residual value or expected value of 19,000. 
She now has to make a decision, which is she going to do, which option is cheaper for her, if the cost of borrowing money is 3% compounded monthly. So let's take a look at the payments and the lease. So remember, she's making uh, lease payments of $390 at the beginning. So that's an annuity due. She's doing that monthly. So monthly payments. And then there's monthly compounding. So it's a simple annuity due. Simple, the payment period and the compounding period match. Due, the payments are at the beginning of every month. So here's the timeline for her. There's her payment at the beginning of the month, 390. She's doing it for two years. So two years, 12 months per year, that's 24 payments. At that time zero though, there's also a down payment she's making of 27.5. And at the end of two years, the vehicle still has an expected or residual value of 19,000. So the first thing is that the present value of the lease payments, so that series of payments has to come back today. And why we're bringing it back to today is because the two options she was given is pay 51,005 immediately, so pay that today, or have the lease. So she needs to compare the two values in today's money. So she needs to bring back the lease payments, and then she'll also need to bring back the residual value. And again, this will be an annuity, and this will be compound interest. So the payments are 390. The periodic rate, again, we have a simple case, monthly payments, monthly compounding, so we can just go 03 over 12. Our periodic rate is double not 25 per month. The number of payment periods coming back, well, there's 12 payments per year times two years, 12 monthly payments. So let's go ahead and figure out the present value of the annuity due using our formula. There's our payment of 390. There's our periodic rate of double not 25. And then there's our 24 monthly per payment periods. So the present value of the lease part, the payments, is 9,096 and 41.6 unrounded. Now let's deal with the residual value of 19,000. Remember that's coming back via compound interest. So we need the compounds interest formula for present value. So the residual or future value is 19,000. We have the same periodic rate, okay, old double not two five per month, and we're still coming back 24 months. So the present value of the residual value is 17,894,86 with all the decimals. So in order to calculate the lease amount, we need to add all three values together, the down payment of 27.5, the present value of the lease payments, and the present value of the residual value. And we're keeping all the decimals for these two and we'll round at the very end. So you can see here, we've kept all the decimals for the lease payments and kept all the decimals for the residual value. Adding them all up and rounding to the nearest cent, we get the lease value or the lease amount is equal to $54,491.29. So if we ask, answer the question, which option is cheaper? Well, buying the car is the actual cheaper option because 51.5 is less than 54,491. But then we also have to sort of put some realism into it. Maybe um, Stephanie can't afford 51,000. 500 right now. Maybe she doesn't have that in the bank to spend. Okay, but these are the types of uh, decisions that we would make on a personal note, but also on a business note. So these are just some examples for our simple and general annuity dues. Hopefully you'll see that they work very similarly to the ordinary annuities, simple ordinary annuity or general ordinary annuity. It's just where the payment is and what the formula being used as.